Are you running that video? Okay. Now we are on. You can start. Okay, we're just good. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I know that we uh, were supposed to do this last month, so I appreciate everyone being flexible. Terry, it's really nice to have you join. Uh, <laughs> kind of enthusiastically responded, I'm always down to talk about parenting. So I was like, all right, the more the merrier to this discussion for sure. Um, so this is our perspective series on parenting with a disability. We've been running perspective series for about four months now. Um, we've had a various different topics. Um, we've had uh, invisible disabilities, uh, navigating the care aid system. We also actually did one on um, parenting children with disabilities, uh, which was which was which was awesome. It was a really really cool discussion. So. Thanks for being a part of these. We're trying to do them every third Monday of the month and always open to topic ideas. And the, the whole sort of format is that we have a panel that's gonna be talking about sort of their expertise with the situation. I'll be facilitating, asking some questions, but we really just want it to be a free flowing, natural, organic conversation. So if you're here in attendance and you would like to either pop a question in the chat box, um, I'll be monitoring that. Or you can simply unmute yourself and just be a part of the discussion if you if you have something to say, which is all help that we just ask that we're respectful of each other's opinions and sort of time on the floor. So yeah, thanks for joining. Um, this is being live streamed. So I just wanna let everyone know, you can decide to have your camera on or off. It's just on our Facebook and YouTube channels so that it can be shared um, for people that couldn't be here today. Uh, also, if you require closed captioning, just make sure to enable your closed captioning in Zoom. We do have closed captioning available. So yeah, we're excited to have an open dialogue here and answer your questions. Um, I definitely have some myself. And I'd love to start by introducing our stellar lineup of panelists. So first we have Marjorie Anus. Am I saying that right? Onos, yeah. That's Onos. Good. Okay. Marjorie Unus, PhD, is a single mother by choice living with a spinal cord injury. She is renowned psycho uh, psychologist and researcher in the field of parenting with disabilities. She's an award-winning inspirational speaker and author of the upcoming book, Mom on Wheels, The Power of Purpose as a Parent with Paraplegia. She lives in Montreal, Canada. So thank you so much for being here, Marjorie. Thank you for the invitation. Next, we have Marco Pasqua. Marco is an award-winning entrepreneur, accessibility consultant, and inspirational speaker with cerebral palsy. Throughout his life, Marco has been involved with a number of organizations as a spokesperson helping to spread advocacy for persons with disabilities across Canada. As an accessibility and inclusion consultant, he has worked with some of BC's biggest change-driven business leaders who are champions for more accessible, inclusive workplaces. As a dad to his daughter, Stella, Marco hopes to teach her empathy and compassion for others while also instilling the drive to go after anything she wants in life. For Marco and his wife, Karen, parenting as an interable couple is all about adaptation and creativity, which happens to be in their wheelhouse. Thank you, Marco. Thanks so much, Emily. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, excited to have you. Uh, next, we have Aaron Broverman, who I understand is a good friend of Marco's. Um, um, yeah. You go back a long way. That's what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So Aaron was a full-time freelance journalist from 2007 to 2021. Over that span, his writing covering both personal finance and disability issues appeared in countless publications, including Vice, Huffington Post, Abilities Magazine, New Mobility Magazine, Yahoo Finance Canada, and CreditCards.com. Since then, he has worked for CreditCardGenius.ca and is about to start as a lead editor at Forbes Canada. So congratulations. Thank you. Aaron has been a dad with a disability, cerebral palsy, since May 5th, 2020, when he and his wife, Brittany, welcomed his now two-year-old son, Wells, into the world. Both Wells and Brittany have dwarfism, and while Aaron cannot claim any expertise when it comes to fatherhood, he is nonetheless excited to share his unique experience muddling through it so far. Yes. <laughs> I think everyone is doing. <laughs> And last but not least, we have Terry Thorson, who has joined the panel. 
Uh, Terry was a support technician for a computer software company and, and a professional dancer before a 1996 motor vehicle crash in Australia left her a tetraplegic. In 2002, she discovered wheelchair racing. Within the span of two years, she returned to Australia to focus on full-time training and made the Canadian national team. Her dedication was rewarded by being able to compete at the 2004 Athens Paralympics in the 400 meter track event where she made the finals. In 2010, Terry gave birth to her now 12 year old son, Lucian, am I saying that right? Lucian. Sorry, took me a minute to find the unmute button there. Lucian, yes, Lucian. Lucian, beautiful. And in 2013 became a single parent. Currently, Terry lives in North Vancouver with her partner and son. She's a board member of BC Wheelchair Sports, president of the Wheel BC Wheelchair Rugby Association and WC Race Series Society. She continued in sport as a player on the BC Provincial Wheelchair Rugby team and is now a coach of wheelchair rugby. Awesome. Welcome, Terry. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So I want to get right into it. An hour always flies by in these discussions. Um, I'm going to sort of start with a question that I had for Marjorie. And then I'm so happy for the, the discussion again to just sort of go where it goes. I have some questions planned out, but uh, whatever, whatever we want to talk about, let's get into it today. So Marjorie, I just wanted to talk about your experience um, as a single mother by choice living with a single cord, a spinal cord injury. Can you tell me a little bit about um, why it was important to you to put that in your bio and what that sort of experience has been like for you? Yeah, because my choice was always to parent on my own. And, um, you know, I, I had my son through insemination. And so I thought I was going to be this independent, fierce woman that could do it all. And then I had a car accident who just like derailed a little bit of that planning. And all of a sudden I went from single by choice to having to co-parent with my parents um, as I was navigating through what a spinal cord injury is and being six months in hospital or in the rehabilitation center before returning to a home that was not adapted, that took actually another 18 months to be adapted. So that was important to me because the, the clash between the two images that I had uh, was very different and I had to adjust very quickly to all of that. Yeah, that's a huge life change in the middle of uh, already a big life change, right? So that's uh, that's incredible that you're doing it on your own. And uh, I guess I think one of the biggest thing that probably comes up is um, sort of when and how to act for support uh, of, for any parent. So it's awesome that you have a good relationship with your parents and we're able to do that. Um, can anyone sort of speak to when is the time to reach out for help? And is that a difficult experience? And are there any tips or tricks that you suggest um, for being able to sort of lean on the people around you when you need to? I'm not on the panel, but I, I work with adults that have kids with disabilities. I work with the Association for Successful Parenting. And I knew when to get help when my daughter that is 11 uh, was not going through the milestones that a typical kid would go through. So that's my, that's one of the things that I would look for, for, for your, for the parents. Okay. So when your child wasn't hitting the milestones that you thought um, sort of should be happening at that time. Okay. That's great advice. If I uh, were to add in there, I would say it really depends on your fam family dynamic and situation. For myself, my parents, um, they live in the Okanagan or in Princeton, British Columbia, so just on the outskirts of the Okanagan, and my wife's parents uh, live in Montreal. So we don't actually have the choice of being able to lean on a lot of family. Uh, my, my sister lives in Kitsilano, which is fairly close to where I live. Um, but, you know, so for us, it was about learning on the fly and adaptation. I, I think that as my daughter's getting older, it's a little bit easier than to say, find a family friend that can babysit. But when she was really, really young, several months old, there's no way that you would leave your child with someone, especially because my wife is still breastfeeding. And so I think that 
each individual is going to have a different circumstance for them and what works for them. But I think that as long as you try your best to anticipate your child's needs and what you've sort of learned as you're going, uh, they're going to need incrementally throughout the day. I think that that's where you make those decisions. And when in doubt, lean on the people that you know that you can trust the most. And hopefully uh, you have a dynamic that allows you to do that. And I'll just add my, yeah. from my perspective, um, I have a bit of a higher level injury, so I don't, so having support um, pre birthing of my child was really important because I knew physically I wasn't going to be able to do certain things with him, like change diapers or get him out of the crib, lift him up, things like that. Uh, so I sort of built a bit of a support system around me, uh, you know, for friends, with family, you know, with professional help. Um, I did have to hire a nanny to help me out because I wanted to be a stay at home parent. But then those support systems have changed quite a bit over the years. Um, so now I do live a little bit closer to my family. As a, a single parent, that was really important. Um, I found men um, who lived around me, like le men within my family, either their friends or, or family members, that could act as role models for my son. Um, and now it's like his, he, he's really into hanging out with his friends. So that is really important. So I have to like give space for him to develop on his own outside of my support system and build his own support system. Totally, which I'm sure is super cool to watch him start to do. I have a well. question while you are doing that. Terry, I have a little girl that's 11. What kind of recommendations would you recommend to get my daughter those, those people in that support system? I'm working on that for my daughter that is nonverbal and just turned 11. She's 11. What kind of recommendations would you give for something like that? Well, just in my experience, I um, like my fun, my son is quite um, uh, mild mannered. He he, I think, is afraid of aggression, like and, and people. He doesn't like people being angry. So I found some people who could sit with him and be calm in their um, mannerism and not get angry, but explain you know why so he had a lot of anger issues especially when i was divorced when i got divorced and he wasn't around his dad all the time you know he was only two and a half so he couldn't express himself so he would throw things or he actually physically barricaded myself in our house at one point in time by moving all the furniture in front of our doors right so i was i, I thought oh i really need some strong calming role models in his life that can just spend some time with him and sit with him and talk to him and not be angry and yelling at him for the things that he did wrong right and a lot of patience <laughs> yeah i think a lot of patience is good advice for any parents for sure um yeah aaron so you're new to parenting two years in yes is that correct yep that's correct Okay, awesome. And in in sort of like speaking with your wife and in planning and family planning, what sort of things went into deciding to have kids? And this is for anybody that has kids, um, you know, and Terry even talking about knowing uh, what kind of help she might need at some point because she wouldn't be able to change diapers and whatnot. Is that sort of conversations that need to happen before uh, children enter the picture? What sort of preparation do you do you sort of recommend parents maybe thinking about starting to have children? Uh, I did a lot of research. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a journalist, so uh, I wrote a lot of articles and, you know, talked to a lot of people about my own experience, you know, while I was also like doing articles and like getting paid to sort of facilitate my own experience and sort of quell my own anxiety. And uh, I ended up going to a lot of conferences uh, that were similar to this, like parents with disabilities who had children, and they gave a lot of great advice in terms of uh, things you could do uh, to carry your child and ad adaptations that you could make and that sort of thing. So I ended up enrolling in like a, a carry me class to sort of learn how to carry 
uh, my child uh, hands free and that sort of thing. Uh, it was very helpful and like beneficial, but it turned out that because my uh, child has dwarfism, because Wealth has dwarfism, uh, his head uh, is like larger and his he had, like there's like back issues and that sort of thing. So I wouldn't be able to carry him in the way that I thought I would when I first did some of the research. So I guess I'd say like do as much research as you can and talk to other kids, other parents with disabilities and see what they do but also recognize that like once the child is bored it can all of that can go out the window and you have to you have to kind of adjust uh i still don't lift wells myself now because i can't but now that he's a little bit older and i don't feel as uh, helpless uh, because when he was a kid, you know, I, I couldn't rely on uh, carrying him. These days, like to put him in bed, I just take out his favorite cereal and sort of throw it ahead of him and he'll follow the cereal to the bedroom and eventually get into his crib for the cereal. So it's nice that he's a little bit more independent and I sort of can lure him in the direction that I want him to go uh, sometimes. You got to get creative. That's awesome. Yeah. Marco, can you speak to that at all? Uh, sort of talking with your partner uh, about, you know, making the decision to to have kids? Yeah, uh, I think Karen and I knew uh, early on that we wanted to have kids. Um, however, I'm not going to lie there. Uh, the wanting to have kids like ebbed and flowed and changed for us um, throughout our relationship, almost because of the dynamics changing of not that we didn't want to have them with each other, but we questioned as we were getting older, um, is this something that we still actually want? Is it going to be too challenging because we were really focused on our careers? And I don't think that has anything to do with the disability. That was more just like, is this something that we still want? Uh, Karen and I are very much planners in everything that we do in our life and our business. And so not that we wanted to apply that to having kids, but we wanted to check in with each other and really make sure, is this something that we think that we can do? I'll be completely honest in the fact that I still felt up to the moment where we made the decision of, yes, we still do want to have kids. And in fact, um, choosing to have kids in our mid thirties, as opposed to say our mid twenties or earlier was a very conscious choice. And I'm very happy uh, myself that we made that decision because I was a completely different person in my mid twenties than I am in my mid thirties. And so I think I'm actually better prepared to be a dad and a more active participant. And I've got all those ducks in a row with everything else in my life and my career now in a way that I can be an even better dad to Stella. And so that's really what weighed into it. Uh, don't get me wrong. I was still scared, uh, but I don't think those had anything to do with my disability. Most of those fears were just parenting in general and, oh my goodness, can we do this? And, um, and Marjorie knows this, you know, we spoke on a parenting, uh, a couple of different parenting events, and she knows the backstory of my fears of my child not respecting me as an adult figure because of my disability. Uh, and obviously those still have not kind of come into fruition because my daughter's only 15 months old, but those fears, I can tell you, have melted away completely, as I said in the presentation um, with the event with Marjorie, because of my daughter not caring about my wheelchair at all. When she sees me at the park, she just runs towards me, says, daddy, hugs my legs, doesn't care that I'm not like, you know, scooping her up while standing like other dads are. It's just to her, I am dad and nothing else matters. The chair doesn't matter. Matter, any adaptions doesn't matter. I'm just dad. And so for me, that doubles down my, my assertion that being a dad and being ready to be a dad at this point in my life was exactly the right decision. And I, I can't, I wouldn't change a thing. And I love every second of it. So it's been great. That's great. Yeah. Marjorie? Yeah, I was going to say, um, not to put words in your daughter's uh, uh, mouth, Marco, but I think it, the chair makes you a cooler dad because she gets to like push you and push this chair when she wants. And that's kind of cool. Absolutely. And you and I have shared that too, because um, you shared with me, if you don't want me saying after your injury, um, you know, your son became almost like a superstar at the hospital and really adapted to the fact that you were now using a chair. Maybe you could speak to that uh, for a moment if, you, if you'd like. Yeah. No, he was wearing his little like doctor's coat and he would just be 
um, everybody's favorite on the ward and basically sort of listening to my heart and saying, you got a good heart, mama, and uh, pushing my wheelchair just like Stella does with Marco. So kids, like they adapt and they adapt fast. They don't really care where we are or what we do. Even Marjorie, now I've read your post about your book. Your son loves your book and things like that and has talked highly about your book. So it makes it makes you proud to make sure that he gets to read parts of it too, so. Proud of you, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Terry, and having having someone that's a little bit older, your, your son being a little bit older, um, when did that sort of, had those conversations come up with you and like, how did you deal with them um, sort of when, when uh, your son noticed that there were some differences in his parents? Um, well, it's funny, he doesn't really talk about it, but it's, but it's interesting because when he was little, so there are things that I've noticed um, definitely with him as, as now that he's getting older. So when he was little, um, I used to always hate the word can't, right? Well, we don't use can't in this house. We always try, blah, 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 right? But now, but physically, there are actually things I can't do. So it's kind of, I'm realizing now as, you know, so he'll say to me, well, you can't walk, mom, right? Like, well, yeah, that is actually true. So, um, and then because I was on my own with him, um, I his protection and safety were very important obviously right i can't i can't actually walk with him across the street holding his hand right so he i had to teach him how to learn how to walk safely across the street with me right um on his own so there are certain fears i think i've built up in him uh, i'm noticing um some of his friends are maybe a little um more uh risky has risky behavior well he's a lot more fearful so like climbing trees well you know when he was little i'm like well i can't save you most of the playgrounds i i took him to weren't accessible so you know you're you're kind of on your own buddy you can climb it or and if you fall then i can't get you um if you jump into that pool you know i can't save you so there were lots of little things like that so now he doesn't like swimming <laughs> he doesn't really try any new things he's definitely so i'm trying to kind of battle that and and work through that right now yeah thanks for sharing that um i think that in retrospect that is an interesting thing to obviously if you didn't feel like mom was there to to help you down from the tree maybe you're not as bold as your friends who have their parents standing right by so that's interesting and it'll be interesting to watch him navigate and you guys navigate you know the next chapter out of that together um are there any resources that you know of i know marco you just did a panel uh on this very topic earlier this month um, but resources that come to mind specific to parents with disabilities where people can go for help and support and advice. Um, have you come across any? I'm actually going to pass it over to Marjorie because I know <laughs> that we have a mutual connection through the event that we did. And we do want to um, spread awareness about um, the adaptations website and page that this individual has created. So Marjorie, take it away if you would. Well, there's definitely um, different website, and I'm sorry, Marco. I hope that I'm going to be talking about the, the the right thing in Quebec. There's definitely one about um, uh, services public agency. Um, there are definitely um, you know different website that will allow you to sort of get um, equipment to um, be made for you, so that you can. So facilitate pushing or rolling the wheelchair. Um, and it's really about finding those. Uh, sometimes it's not super easy. Um, that's why I guess, you know, being able to link up as parents, we are able to sort of share those resources based on our specific needs. Um, and so uh, that's what we do. And we try to, to find those, those ways ourselves. And, yeah, the, the resource I was speaking about was actually the adaptive, I think, adaptive parenting project uh, with the individual that we spoke to oh, who's yes, based out of the based out of the US, um, who has actually 
saw what we saw, which is that there isn't a whole heck of a lot of resources that have been, uh, you know, sort of um, collected uh, for uh, individuals. And I would say my piece of advice, so it's uh, the Adaptive Parenting Project. I'm not sure what the URL is. Um, maybe Marjorie, as I'm speaking, you can maybe pull that up or, or I'm one of those things. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. we go. Uh, but the, the other thing that I would recommend, which is two resources that I used locally here in British Columbia, uh, was, which is the Tetra Society um, by the Disability Foundation. And that's who did my adaptive crib. Um, and they do custom projects for individuals who have physical disabilities. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a parent, um, but they basically ask you to submit what project you're looking for, for adaptation, for quality of life, uh, to increase your quality of life. And in my case, it was um, an adaptive crib, which was raised so that I could wheel underneath it and actually open up the sides of the crib and uh, and be, you know, greet my daughter Stella every morning and pick her up and that sort of thing. Oh, there we go. Marjorie's posted um, the Instagram to the Adaptive Parenting Project uh, into the chat right now. Um, so the Tetris Society is fantastic. And the other one here in British Columbia that I um, utilized uh, was the uh, technologyforliving.org. Uh, a technology for living organization does smart technology, like smart lights, smart thermostats, blinds, curtains, that kind of thing. So that if you are potentially a wheelchair user or unable to reach certain things due to being vertically challenged, maybe you're a bit shorter in stature or whatever the case may be, and you want to use voice technology or smart tech, um, if you apply and become a member for technology for independent living um, and you're approved, they can do things like have a technician come to your home, install those things uh, at no cost to you as a member, which I might add, that's huge. Um, and then second thing is they also have an automatic door program, which every member can apply for, that if you do need an automated door in your place of living, they actually will uh, take applications to have a door installed in your permanent home for automatic doors. So I didn't even know those existed prior to being mm -hmm. a uh, parent, um, but I know that other individuals that I've worked with in the past, uh, Terry, you might know uh, Jim, Jamie Borsoff. Uh, Jamie has is kind of a bit of an engineer himself here um, in British Columbia, and I know that he, as a dad, uh, which has children who are much older, um, but when when he was first a parent, he was engineering his own adaptions to attach to the front of his wheelchair and various other things. So it's it's not what you know necessarily; it's also who you know, and being able to tap into those local resources wherever you live across the country and around the world. Lean on your friends ask questions and find out and uncover those rocks of places that you may not know have known about before. I would also say that Tetra isn't just in BC. There's uh, various That's right. uh, chapters across Ontario and other places in Canada. I actually took advantage of them. They uh, created a cart so that I could pull wells behind my scooter so that I could pick him up from from daycare and stuff like that. There's also the Center for Independent Living. They have a lot of parenting resources. Uh, they're around in Toronto and other places across Canada. Uh, and uh, they were very helpful uh, for putting on panels, even just like reading times with your children, just so you could even get to know other parents with disabilities so that you can feel like you're not alone. We, and I live in the U.S., but we have uh, the Association for Successful Parenting. And when I'm done, I'll, I'll put the website in for you guys. Uh, but we speak to people that have just gotten into the system and just talk about people with disabilities. I have a story. I talk about my story. And we get introduced, and we're working in Canada. We have a gentleman on our board in British Columbia. So we're working in Canada. We work in the US and we I've worked a little bit in Australia because they do a lot of the, the uh, parenting in Australia. So we we help everybody out as much as we can. And we have resources for all over. So um, and we're welcome to add more things to our website. But as soon as I'm done talking, I'll put that website in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I would love to get in touch with somebody that was representing BC and maybe we can have them on connect together to do a presentation about some of those resources. Um, I'm also going to make sure that I save the chat and make a list of all this and email all registrants 
um, for this uh, panel, uh, all of the stuff that's been listed. And e Emily, you might actually know this, but I, I'm pretty sure Tetris Society is across North America. So not just in Canada, um, there are other elements of it as well. Uh, and uh, and they're a part of the Disability Foundation. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is, it's kind of like full circle here. We're talking about resources that are available to everyone uh, to the best of our ability, so. Yeah, Tetra is, it is nationwide, so it is Canada, but it is all across Canada. And, gotcha, um, gotcha. Yeah. And, you know, the link that I put in here is the solutions link. So you can actually tell us a little bit about what's going on, tell Tetra, and sort of what you're in need of. And then volunteers from all over the country come together to build something for you. So they've done some really, really outstanding work. Um, so, yeah, definitely recommend checking that out. I kind of wanted to just comment on something that um, Aaron was saying. Because I think it is important or would be very important just as a new parent getting to know other new parents. Um, how important has it been to find a community, if you have, of parents that do have disabilities? How important has that been to your journey and how did you go about finding a community? Does anyone want to uh, talk to that first? Yeah. I can speak to that, I guess. Um, yeah, so I guess I just... Uh, I knew that the Center for Independent Living uh, helped people with disabilities like independently live. So uh, and they were very helpful, like, you know, for people making the transition from like home to like, you know, getting their own apartment and that sort of thing. So uh, I kind of thought that they would be, you know, some place that I could at least go and they would know of, you know, some parenting resources and that sort of thing. And it turned out that the, at the time they had just started the like parenting wing and right around the time, you know, Wells was about to be born, they were having their first conference on parenting with a disability. So I, it seemed like a godsend. So I went and there I found a lot of uh, people with like tables, uh, you know, resources where you could actually get in home uh, help if you were uh, if you had enough of a disability and qualified and also just uh, different adaptive like slings and different things that were out there uh, like the Tetra Society and, and other things uh, but then also you know one of the most helpful things were just people who'd already done it kind of speaking about their experience uh, speaking about sort of the ostracization they felt from like the medical community uh you know in terms of like you know some doctors would tell them like you shouldn't be having children and that kind of thing so so there was also that too that sometimes you know you learn about people who aren't as supportive but it was it was really helpful like if you know i, I heard from people that were like visually impaired telling me like how they were able to like you know get their kid across the street and, I, and it just makes you think like if somebody with you know, even more challenges than you have can do it. You know, why can't you kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah. would think that that would be inspiring and supportive. Um, that's horrible to hear that there is ostracization, but there, I'm sure that there is. And yeah. um, does anyone else sort of want to talk about their experiences with that and any advice that they might have? Yeah, yeah, Marjorie, I, I saw you unmuted, so I'm going to I'm going to wait now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that for me, it was really the um, the community that I found over social media, which is, you know, we often talk about the danger of social media. But for me, it was really connecting to to all the parents that I've met um, who have their own struggles, um, have their own like beauty in parenting and were able to share that. Um, certainly like the event that Marco and I co-produced where all of these parents were able to share lifted me up because it, it showed me that we're all creative. And at the end of the day, it's really about finding our own solutions um, and that we're doing this, you know, together. And it's not just like me, poor me, but it, it's actually sort of yay us because we're doing so much uh, great stuff. And our kids are, are wonderful. I mean, if I see my, my son, he's very creative, very solution finding mindset. Uh, very justice driven as well. And um, it's beautiful to see how that has shaped him in his development. 
Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And I would I would add um, that, as I said earlier, uh, with both my wife and I sets of parents not being uh, geographically close and my daughter being born in uh, during the crux of covid, uh, you know, so social distancing was obviously an issue between my wife and I, because there you go. Uh, But uh, but no, it was one of those situations where. Um, we did feel very isolated uh, in the beginning. Uh, fortunately, I was. Uh, we were at a point in the pandemic where I was actually allowed to be in the room uh, when my wife was giving birth, which was kind of up in the air actually prior to all of that happening. Is we didn't even know if that was going to be a possibility. Um, but it was also uh, sad a little bit because leading up to it, I wasn't. We weren't able to go to live Lamas classes or anything like that. Like none of that was happening. The world was basically shut down. So we felt very isolated. And I I think that it's important to mention that aside of any physical disabilities or any other disabilities that may be obvious to some people, keeping in check your mental health throughout the process of parenting um, is really important, pandemic or no pandemic, uh, because you can start to feel really alone when you don't know what the next stage is going to be. And spoiler alert, I don't think most of us know what the next stage is going to be because every one of our children is different. And so um, their ability to adapt to sleep regressions, which are a fun thing, not at all, I I might add. And my daughter has hit every single sleep regression um, and probably some extras actually, um, because she that's the one thing that she struggles with. So that's been a challenge. Um, But fortunately, she's been really good when it comes to eating and things of that nature. So, you know, you give and take and you learn and you adapt as you go, but keeping in check your mental health, keeping in check your physical health so that you can be at your peak performance, whatever that looks like for you, disability or not, so that you can be the best parent you can possibly be is the best thing for you. And then the groups and the collectives and the people that you'll find they'll sort of follow. It's, I, I mean, maybe it's a little bit of the law of attraction. If you put yourself out there and say you're looking for these resources, they're, they're there. My, my wife found um, a bunch of groups on Facebook. Uh, there's a group locally called Mamas for Mamas that she's always talking about on Facebook where if you need something, you just call out to this group and it's, it's not based on financial transactions. It's literally, hey, does anyone have any spare clothes or even spare food this month if you're struggling or you're in poverty? And the collective of these women coming together and saying, we got your back, no problem. And they'll literally hand deliver food, no questions asked to your home or, or, or clothing. Fortunately, we haven't had to access any of those things, but knowing that they're available there and that there are people that you can turn to complete strangers in your community that you wouldn't otherwise know about that is really exciting and that really warmed my heart throughout this entire process that's awesome yeah i think uh mamas for mamas that's great also having the courage to ask and you know being able to really admit you need help here and um yeah i think people are very inherently good and that's very heartwarming to hear that there's groups like that out there aaron you touched a little bit on um how there are some uh organizations or processes to go through to get some in-home help um has anyone been through any of those processes i know terry you were talking about having a nanny i believe um and sort of any advice in finding the right help and if there is financial out aid out there for parents with disabilities? Well, for myself, I didn't really, it, it was really, really challenging because I had my own personal support, but they don't deal anything with the baby. So I had to, so the personal support was how, you know, like the ministry did, does help you financially, um, but they will not even touch a a baby. So I had to hire privately my own um, support. And how did you go about doing that? Finding the right person? Well, just, I knew sort of what my values were and I did lots of interviews, just how you would hire anybody really, like who would be the best fit, who would go along with what I would want. Also understanding that I'm going to be there. So it wasn't a nanny where I'm going to be at work. So I'm still the mom and I'm still going to be directing you. You're really just my hands and arms and legs. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Anyone else with experience with hiring help? 
I didn't hire any help. It was my mom actually who was uh, doing that, especially at the beginning when I came back from rehabilitation center. Um, but what I was going to say is that I believe uh, Ontario is the only province with the uh, nurturing assistant program, which is basically sort of if you receive help um, for your physical needs, then you could sort of add uh, a little bit of pocket of money to be able to hire someone to help you out. And um, I, the reason why I'm mentioning it is because I think that this should be across Canada and should be available to everybody as this is like an essential uh, resource. So I'm just um, throwing it out there um, and hoping that, uh, you know, somebody listens and, and we could do something uh, collectively. Yeah, it's a very any, long link I found. <laughs> I was going to say any, anyone in government who's listening um, on the record or live or anything, let's make that happen because my wife and I, you know, as I said, are, are very busy, you know, professionals running our own business and, we may have to look at nanny nannyhood or nanny ship or whatever the case may be so that we can be, um, you know, focused on being parents, but also, uh, you know, on some days it may not work. And, you know, the daycare system is touch and go various in depending on various communities. And in fact, some daycares um, are cost prohibitive um, simply because you need a second mortgage literally just to, to have your kid in full-time daycare. And that's not something that my wife and I uh, want to pursue at all. The reason why we run our own business is we want to be active parents who can flex our schedule that way. But having that extra set of hands, if there's a meeting where we literally can't bring our baby into the boardroom. And thankfully, we have clients we work with and architectural firms we work with. We literally have our daughter listed as a junior associate on our website with her profile photo and a thumbs up or she's pushing an adaptive button so that they know in advance we might be bringing our daughter to the meeting and we let them know uh, but she's so well behaved but that's not always going to fly there's going to be meetings where we just can't bring her and so we need to know those things in advance so uh yeah let's make this a universal sort of approach to all people um especially because hey i think we all pay enough taxes that there's got to be something in there uh, where we can make this happen um, especially for those in need Marco, you're talking about your business. What kind of business do you have? You and your wife have? Yeah. So curious. yeah, we're, we're 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 universal design and accessibility consultants. So we work with municipalities and businesses on how to create universal, uh, universally designed spaces and and communities. And so it's been it's been fantastic up to this point. My wife's currently on that leave, but she'll be joining me full time um, after the summer um, in the business for the first time uh, since I've been running uh, my business over the past decade here. And uh, so it's an exciting new venture, but we want to be planful and mindful um, throughout the entire process. Very cool. Very important work. Uh, Marco, do you work in individual housing at all either? Is it all sort of city spaces? So uh, there's a little bit of a touch point for individual housing because I'm a trained Rick Hansen uh, Foundation Accessibility Professional and the Rick Hansen Program Certification is actually going to be looking into adapted housing. Uh, there are other standards um, used across Canada and the US, uh, like the Safer Home Standards um, and things of that nature for adaptability. But absolutely, that's one of the things that we think about because I had to do it for my own home. Like I don't have any accessibility adaptions uh, that are traditional around my home. I don't have any grab bars or anything like that, but I just know how to design a space where it doesn't have to look medical, but yet it works for me when it comes to wheelchair transfers and it still is aesthetically pleasing. So I want to double down on that and say, anyone who wants to adapt their home and has a disability or a newly acquired disability, this doesn't mean that your house has to look like a hospital. You can do it in such a way that it looks really stylish, sleek, and attractive. And when people enter your home, they go, wait, didn't you just say your house was accessible? I don't see any of the adaptations. And then your, your next response should be exactly. Because anything that's truly designed universally, you shouldn't notice the differences. You should just be able to be in your own home or your workplace and make that happen. So I'm absolutely open to taking questions from people who come in after this event and they want to know these types of things. Mm -hmm. um, but for sure, it's always good to have somebody on your team um, who has knowledge in this space that can help you feel dignified and have that quality of life while also making sure that your house is adapted to your needs. Awesome. Yeah, we're hosting an accessible community forum on uh, July 22nd on accessible housing. So maybe I'll reach out to you for some uh, some contacts. Awesome. Awesome.
Getting back to uh, the topic at hand, I just wanted to ask, uh, we had a really awesome question um, written up by one of our program assistants. I thought it was really beautiful. So I just wanted to ask you all individually, how has being a parent influenced the way you understand and experience your disability? Terry, do you want to talk to that first? You just put me on the spot, Emily. Like thoughtful, thoughtful. You're in the top right left here. corner of my screen. Oh. So I just. Um, well, I think that um, I've realized how much patience I really have, especially on having a child. When he has temper, when he had temper tantrums when he was young, I literally could sit there with him for an hour and just let it out, buddy, let it out, right? Um, I have realized that disability is, you know, saying those words, I can't do this is, is okay. Like to be honest about my disability and what I can and can't do. Um, and, and it's okay um, to be able to do that and just to know how you need the adaptions. Um, how has it also influenced, um, my experience? I don't know. I'll, other people talk. If I have anything else to say, I'll say it at the end. <laughs> okay. You can add in. Thank you so much for sharing. Aaron. So I'm in a unique situation because both my wife and my son have disabilities. They both have dwarfism. So not only do we have to adapt things for us in terms of parenting, but a lot of times we have to adapt things for him. Uh, he goes to daycare, so and because he's a person with a disability and he has some medical needs, uh, you know, we get resources like uh, the Center for Ability and at different different places where you know that can help us with like adapting his daycare and making sure that like he is like a full participant uh his daycare is set up so that like you know we have the right stools and we have the right chairs and stuff so that he can feel on the same level when he's like playing with his peers and that sort of thing uh my wife is really good about that because she's connected to the little people of america and the little people of ontario so she's really good about that kind of resources in terms of my actual outlook on my own disability uh i'm sort of keenly aware about how my own biases my own thoughts my own fears about my disability can be visited on my child and i don't want him to grow up with some of the same internal dialogues that i used to have because he's going to have to deal with the realization that he's different as well. Um, it's not going to be, I think, as challenging for him because he already lives in a home where everybody has a disability. So it'll be like more normal for him. But still, I have, I've got to be very careful even now about how I'm like sort of talking about my disability and my capabilities. And, you know, when I get frustrated, like I don't want to get too frustrated because I don't want him to internalize that like he can't do particular things and, and that sort of thing just because just because I can't in a particular way. Um, and so I want him to have sort of a healthy relationship with his disability. So I'm starting to try and uh, make that happen and be conscious of that for myself uh, while, you know, while he can't uh, talk and, and really uh, uh, realize what's happening, hopefully. Yeah, that's great advice. How to yeah. have a healthy relationship with your disability and by leading by example, right? I think right. any parent starts to watch their self talk a little bit more, right. even, you know, what they're putting into their body, how they're living their life when they have to be an example and want to be an example for somebody else. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Marjorie? Yeah, I love that answer, um, Aaron, um, because I also lived with internalized ableism. That's what I realized when I had uh, when I became disabled. Um, but what I would say is, for me specifically, it, it was the ability to slow down, and that it was okay to slow down. Um, as a parent, you want to slow down because you want to savor those little moments with your with your child. And I felt that my disability was 
making me slow down and I didn't want that. Um, but it was sort of like understanding that, well, anyways, you know, as a parent, I would have wanted to slow down anyways. So uh, one or the other is just uh, minute. It's the time that I spend with him. That's the most important. I love that. Marco? Yeah, I would say for me, it was uh, help having to redefine what a capable uh, definition of a capable dad looks like, and really actually taking that in stride, you know, understanding that being a present father and redefining that a father's role in the dynamic of raising a child is just as important as the mother's role, even if you play different parts, at least for me. Um, and having those male figures in the life of the child is important. Terry, you spoke to that as well, surrounding your, your son with uh, male figures that you felt uh, he could potentially emulate around. And even though my, I have a daughter, uh, I still want her to know that her dad is 100% capable to be 100% there for her uh, in whatever ways that she needs. And it's it's incredible because she does seek me at times over her mother. The other, just yesterday, actually, um, she woke up and we heard her on the baby monitor and she was crying out, dad, 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 the whole time. So my wife brought her into our bedroom to show her. I think she actually had a nightmare that something happened to me or, or what have you. Um, because when she brought her into the room and showed her that I was there and I was okay, she calmed down. So to me, to know that my daughter in her mind, even internally, she's seeking me, um, was that affirmation of... Um, she does see me as that parental figure and she loves and embraces me as her dad. And that's so, so important. And then the other aspect of this, which is nothing to do with disability, I would say is selflessness and what it teaches you about selflessness, because you may think that you have it all figured out and, and, and all of this, but being a parent teaches you that your child's needs come before your own. And I'm totally fine with that. So it teaches you, as uh, Marjorie said, to slow down and to know that, hey, we're operating on Stella's schedule and that's okay. And I will work my life around what my daughter needs any day of the week, no matter how important of a CEO might have a meeting with me or things like this. It's just, let's understand we've got this going on. And maybe that's the silver lining with the pandemic is that people have realized um, we all need to slow down and uh, people are more accepting now in professional settings that we do have a family life. It's not something to be ashamed of. Like, hey, cut that out. We don't want to hear about that from nine to five. No, 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 no. Our life and who we are as people is reflected in everything we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if in our case, that happens to be the fact that we have a family and that this is part of who we are, let's embrace and accept that so that people can bring their whole self to every situation that they do in life. So that's been pretty powerful for me. Yeah, that's great. That is powerful. Very awesome. Okay, well, we have like just under 10 minutes left. As I say, it always absolutely whizzes by. So I do encourage anybody um, that's participating, if they have a question they want to ask, type it in the chat. I'm also going to put my email in the chat so you can email me and I can put you directly in touch with our panelists if you have any specific questions. But I'd love to just go around one last time. And if everyone could just give, you know, sort of top two, top three pieces of advice specific to a new parent with a disability. I'm not gonna start with Terry. Aaron. <laughs> Give I, would just, I would just say don't get discouraged. And just because you might not be able to like interact directly with your child all the time doesn't mean you can't contribute to the household. I think it's important to note that like part of being a parent is helping out your partner too, like doing the dishes and doing, you know, doing the laundry and doing some of those tasks, going to grocery shopping and that sort of thing. Uh, I think early on when I was, when I was afraid that like, if I wasn't directly involved in the raising of, of the child of my son, I wasn't a dad, uh, a therapist and a counselor actually told me, no, 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 like, Part of your responsibility is to make the primary caregiver, if there is one, their life easier. So even if you you aren't actually, you know, feeding the child or putting them to bed or that sort of thing, you have to be knocking off things 
off of the person who is doing that. You have to knock off stuff off of their list. So I think we should think about that as parenting and think about parenting in a more holistic way. That's really great advice that, you know, if you're not contributing directly to the child at that moment in time, contributing to the household is still very much a part of the job. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, Terry. Um, yeah, that that's great advice, Erin. And, you know, just to build on that, I think that, you know, um, and to add to it, I was so fearful um, of certain things like, you know, being alone with him when he was a baby. What if I can't do, do certain things? What if I can't save him, you know, if he was choking or, um, and there was lots of instances where it was scary that he got himself into something and I couldn't help him. But it is pretty amazing. Um, I mean, first of all, children are so resilient, but it is pretty amazing how resilient we are. And I think having our disabilities have really helped to contribute to that as well. Um, and uh, being able to like cope with maybe scary situations and be calm uh, um, under pressure has really helped. So, and you know, just building my support team was really, really important for me. And whatever that looks like for you, I think, you know, as Marjorie suggested, like social media, sometimes it's just building a little community on social media, which I've gone to for sure. You know, I've had some great friends through my life that have disabilities, but also when I moved to a community that um, I wasn't familiar, familiar with, I wanted to be around other moms, right? None of them had a disability, but they were a great support group and made sure that everything was accessible that we could go to as parents. Um, and then they also helped, you know, take my son on, on to the playgrounds or things like that. So um, yeah, the support team was really important. Get a good support team for sure. Marco? Yeah, uh, I guess to add on, I agree with everything that uh, my colleagues have said, but to add on to that, I'd say um, be prepared to make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes. Uh, those things, uh, I always say there's no uh, win and lose, there's win and learn. Uh, because if you change your mindset around the things that happen to you in life, uh, there's always something to take away from it. Uh, and so you may have gone into the process of being a parent or thinking about being a parent and saying, I'm going to do it all like this. And then your child dictates to how exactly things are going to go. And that's totally fine. Uh, I knew that I would be able to interact with my daughter as she got older easier uh, because when she was younger, a brand newborn, um, I was so nervous, just like any I had parent, um, because she was so tiny and frail. My goodness, did I not want to hold her or accidentally drop her off my wheelchair or something like this. But now, you know, with her being 15 months, I waited for the day that she could be an overall so I could pick her up. Up like a like a suitcase and just carry her around the house and she loves it you know so it's totally fine to know to Aaron's point know the times at which you can insert yourself based on your abilities and know the times that just bringing your your partner a glass of water is exactly what they needed in that moment because they had their hands full so uh yeah just just be open to it and uh, you'll be surprised at what you discover about yourself and also, maybe if you are going to be doing lifting in whatever way you can, um, practice the way in which you think you might be lifting um, in advance because, you know, doing it, uh, and uh, as I said in some video clips in the past, lifting weights at a gym and lifting a child when they're flailing around is a completely different ball game. So however your child is going to be and however you're going to adapt your ability to pick them up, figure that out and start your, your Rocky montage of training and doing those things because getting ahead of that and knowing that it's actually kind of exciting. And then you can apply those skill sets once you're, you're ready to do so. That's awesome. That's a great tidbit for sure. Marjorie in closing. So when I, I will say, I love hearing the perspective of men in parenting because, you know, sometimes it's so like more wild than, than what we could bring uh, forward, but I love it because kids need that. And, um, what I would say is to believe in yourself. You can figure it out just like you could figure out pretty much anything in your life. If you can't, you have support system like Terry mentioned. Um, but it's also to remember, I think that parenting, sometimes it's 
as simple as being the witness of your child's life. And so when I couldn't be the one who was giving Thomas's his bath, it was my mom who did all the actions. It was okay because I was in the bathroom. I was the one directed my mom. And I was the one sort of being there um, and never letting go of what I could do uh, in different ways. So I think that being the witness of our child's life and being involved in in what's happening in their lives is what parenting is about. And we could do that many different ways. It looks different. Yeah, looks different for everybody. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here today. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your stories. I think that there's so much to be learned from everybody sharing their stories and, you know, just sort of permission for people to make mistakes and to have these feelings and fears. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate everyone showing up for each other today. Uh, I have put um, a couple of links to our other programming in the chat. Again, um, I will be sending out a list of resources that we discussed here to all of our um, attendees. And we have a resource page on our website um, that has other various topics that we've covered. So we're gonna start working on a one for parents with disabilities as well. Okay, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kazer, thank for you, running everybody. tech. Everyone have a wonderful rest Thanks, of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.